Today's passage is going to be in Ezra, chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. Ezra, chapter 8, verses 21 to 23. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might humble ourselves before our God, to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves our children, and all our goods. For I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen. <coughs> to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king, the hand of our God is for good, on all those who seek him and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him so we fasted and implored our God for this and he listened to our entreaty let's pray Heavenly Father that you our awesome God may rest upon us and that you our God always preserve and keep watch over us your people and your faith, who has given it to us by our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray all these things in your name. Amen. Amen. There are four uses of the word preserve. There is preserve life. There is preserve food. There is preserve as in preserving like kimchi or fruit or vegetables there is a preserve of nature there's trees there's birds there's habitat so there's four uses of preserve in each of these word uses of the word preserve something is being protected and is being prevented from being attacked or inundated by outside usually a preservative protects so the food does not go bad. So the reason for a preservative is to make sure that the food does not ferment. And we like kimchi so much. But the fermentation is the addition of something outside, like bacteria, as alcohol ferments. But preservative prevents the fermentation, prevents the alcohol from happening, prevents the food from rotting. That's what salt does. Salt prevents food from going bad so that is preserve to prevent outside to spoil what is inside and so when Ezra is speaking to his God here in verses 21 to 23 he's proclaiming a fast why because he's afraid he's afraid of where they have to go next he has to take the exiles from where they are the river Ahava to the promised land and the promised land is to preserve it's the place where the people will go and find their final rest their final rest is not ahava the final rest is not babylonia the final rest is the land of the promise and it's called the land of the promise because god whom they worshiped promised them that land the land is theirs but only if he is their god and they are his people. The promise can only be promised to those who fear the Lord and worship God. So to preserve their life means that it is God whom they worship, whom he has called their people, who will be at the land of promise. And so Ezra prays, but he doesn't pray for himself. He says, then I proclaim the fast there that we might humble ourselves. So he's not praying for himself, and he's not praying for them. He's praying for everybody, himself and the people. And he's not praying. He's proclaiming. It's a proclamation. It's more than a prayer. And it's more than a sermon. And it's not a benediction. But he is concerned for their welfare as much as God is concerned for their welfare. In fact, Ezra is more than just a scribe and a prophet here then i proclaimed a fast to seek from him god a safe journey 
So he is inquiring. But more than inquiring, he is beseeching. And more than beseeching, he is standing in front of God, asking God for these people for their safe journey. So in a sense, he's not asking them as if he is a prophet, although he is a prophet. He is asking them as if he stands in the middle between man and God, an intermediary, a preservative. He is preserving them. He's the salt. He is their salt. He is preventing outside from intrusion into the inside people. He is like Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, his performance, his role, his office, his reality as scribe is like Jesus Christ. And people will say the prophet Ezra is like Jesus Christ in many ways. But I'm going to go one step further. More than just Jesus Christ, because he can be identified as such. But by faith in Jesus Christ, we also have now the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. What does the indwelling of the Holy Spirit have to do with faith in Jesus Christ? Oh, it's very important. Because as Jesus Christ is human being, and as he came onto this earth and he died on the cross, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. So the physical bodily person of the second person of the Trinity is not here. He is here in spirit, his spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now, what does the Holy Spirit do in the place of Jesus Christ? Well, he's not more powerful than Jesus, but he is every way Jesus. And his performance as the third person of the Trinity ensures that all the people of God enter into his rest. Like Ezra, only not Ezra, because Ezra is a human being. Ezra will only live to so many years, and then he will die. But Jesus Christ came on the earth, died, resurrected. He's forevermore, but he's forevermore in heaven. His dwelling with us comes in the form of his spirit, and his spirit dwells inside of all those people who call him his people. And therefore, he is truly the preservative. Amen. Who presents and who preserves and who makes certain and who guarantees and who affirms and who confirms and who assures and who makes sure that all of his people are his people and all of his people who are his people end up in the same place at the same time so that he does not lose any and everyone who does not call him his people can enter in who makes sure of that that's the holy spirit that means as the person of the third man of the trinity that is the holy spirit he makes certain that outsiders do not come in. This may be a hard lesson for those of you who are listening to this. The Holy Spirit prevents outsiders from coming in. What does that mean? That means that the people of God are truly the people of God because they not only have faith in Jesus Christ, but they have the Holy Spirit. That's what makes them a people of God. They can worship God. They can go to church every Sunday. They can perform all the good deeds. But unless they have the Holy Spirit, it's useless. Because the Holy Spirit guarantees the faith that they can worship God together. And therefore, the preservative, the true preservative, that is the Holy Spirit, assures their faith. You can say that you believe in Jesus. But truly to be a believer in Jesus, you must have the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit comes to us into our hearts. And he dwells in there by faith. And by faith, I mean that you believe in the one true God. And that you accept Jesus Christ as your, whole and, uh, as your one and only Savior. And that you speak with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. And you believe in your heart that, he, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You will be saved. This is a hard lesson for some of us. A hard lesson because it matters on faith. It's not mattered on goods. It's not mattered on good looks. It's not mattered on whether or not you can perform to the excellencies of God. It matters not how well you do in your life. It matters on one thing, faith. That's all that matters. Paul said that if you believe in your heart Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. 
It, he didn't say that if you perform excellencies of God. It, he didn't say if you went out into the street and you perform good works for the excellencies of God. It, he didn't say that if you looked like a Christian or you were born into a Christian family, you will be saved. He said by faith. By faith. And only by faith will the preservative come into your life and will exclude all the evil that might endanger your faith. Now, there are things that can endanger faith. But here, the Holy Spirit preserves, makes sure, makes certain that the faith is genuine. Sure, but genuine. And that's what makes the people of God a people of God. Genuine faith. Not pretend faith, not fake faith, not salt that doesn't work. Because that's not salt, as Jesus said. Salt of the earth loses its saltiness, must be thrown away. Well, if you think real hard, when can salt ever lose its saltiness? It doesn't make any sense. Salt can never lose its saltiness. Salt remains salt unless salt disappears and dissolves in water. And then when it's nothing, then it goes away. Ah, true, true genuine salt, if dissolved, because it acts as its genuine character. And so those who have faith will explore and exemplify and manifest true faith because they exemplify and manifest true genuine faith. True genuine faith must be exemplified in good works. So in this passage, as Ezra prays, He says that the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. And so we fasted and implored our God for this, and he listened to our entreaty. And only Ezra, through the power of God, would have known that God had listened to his entreaty. Just like the Holy Spirit who stands before you, does the people of God know that Ezra was standing before God praying for this? Probably not. There were two million Israelites. Every two million Israelite did not know whether or not Ezra was praying this prayer. Did he get up in the middle of the morning? Or did he get up in the middle of the night and he said, Oh, Israel, I am praying this prayer to God. <clears throat> Most likely not. That means when the Holy Spirit acts on your behalf, he's praying for you. He's making certain when is it not certain that your faith is going to make it? When? I'll tell you when. T two things. When you're sleeping and when you're dead. When you're sleeping, you don't know what evil lies lurking in your imagination and outside of you. And when you're dead, it's too late. So, if those two realities encompass human life, in your sleep and in your death. My question to you as I finish this sermon is, where does your faith lie? Does it lie from yourself? Can you ensure that when you're sleeping that your faith is genuine? Or do you believe in a God who ensures your faith is genuine? Because then you can sleep at night. But even more, can you ensure that your faith will end up in heaven for eternal life? Because if you cannot, then when your end comes, can you guarantee that your final rest will be the final rest that you want? Or will it be eternal damnation? There's only two possible realities at the end of life. The insurance that you will be in heaven in eternal life with the Father or eternal damnation where he turns his face away. This is what Ezra says. That's what Ezra says. That those who fear the Lord will be hugged, will be gravitated towards the Father. Where the Father comes and he implores him as a son. Or, the Father will turn his face. And lucky for us that we have a Jesus who experienced that. The only person on the face of our human life who ever experienced the forsakenness of God. When he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The second person of the Trinity experienced the one thing that is not promised to his people. 
that if you go to heaven, you will never experience what Jesus experienced. Not only the pain and suffering of sin, but being forsaken by God. And the reason why you will never face that is because of faith. The third person of the Trinity who stands with us in heaven. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before the presence. We come before your thanksgiving. We come before the Holy Spirit. We ask that you will help us. Help us in our Christian walk. Help us in our Christian life. That we will enter into your rest. And that we will enter into your faith. Faith that you have given to us. May you continue to guide us and mold us by your hand. By your loving hands. By your loving Holy Spirit that dwells inside your people by faith. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.